All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome and good evening. Thanks for joining us virtually tonight. My name is Maddie Walters, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm pleased to introduce this virtual event with Zach Sala, presenting his new book, Let's Get Back to the Party, in conversation with Nick White. Tonight's event is part of Harvard Bookstore's New Voices in Fiction series, presented with Grub Street, highlighting debut novelists discussing their work and the writing process. Through virtual events like tonight, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to you and others in our community during these challenging times. Every week we're hosting events here on our Zoom, and as always, our event schedule appears on our website, harvard.com slash events, where you can also sign up for our weekly email newsletter and browse our shelves from home. Um, this evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time tonight, go to the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. We'll get through as many as we can. In the chat box during this presentation, you'll see a link to purchase tonight's book online. All sales through this link support Harvard Bookstore, so thank you for your support during this trying time for community spaces like your local bookstores. You'll also find a link to donate in the chat box. Your purchases and contributions make this virtual author series possible, and now more than ever supports the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you for tuning in in support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers here at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely support we sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings through the past year, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them quickly. Thanks for your patience and understanding. And now I'm pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Zach Sala is the debut novelist of tonight's book, Let's Get Back to the Party, which was named a most anticipated book of 2021 and praised by O, the Oprah Magazine, as a stirring ode to the many faces of queerness and an intimate saga that brims with necessary conversations about cultural identity. His writing has appeared in Crazy Horse, the Chattahoochee River Review, The Millions, The Rumpus, and more. Nick White is an assistant professor of English at the Ohio State University's MFA program in creative writing. His previous works include the novel, How to Survive a Summer, and the story collection, Sweet and Low. His work has appeared in the Kenyan Review, Catapult, the Hopkins Review, Indiana Review, Lit Hub, and more. I'm so pleased to turn things over to tonight's speakers. Zach and Nick, the digital podium is all yours. Thanks, Maddie, and, and thanks to, to Harvard Bookstore for, for having me. And, um, and thank you, Nick White. Um, I have paid my internet bill, so we should not have any technical issues, at least on my end. If, it, won't be, it won't be me. It won't be my fault if something happens. And I'm using the internet service at Ohio State, so uh, I hope <laughs> that that, uh, that stays working as well. Um, did we want to uh, talk about like what we we're going to do tonight? Like you would like uh, we can sort of give the audience like an idea of like you're going to read for a bit. And then after Zach reads, um, we're going to have a talk about his book, his wonderful book that I am so excited to talk about. I have so many questions and it's just thrilled to be able to chat with the author about this uh, wonderful novel. Um, and then we will after our conversation, open it up to people who have asked us questions in the chat. Yeah, I'll, so I'll just go ahead and, and read maybe three or four pages. Um, and and if, if I go on too long, just snap your fingers, Nick, and I'll-, and I'll Never, post. never. Um, this, is, this is from the, be close to the beginning. It's the second chapter. So there's, there's not much to know other than the original setup which is that this novel starts in um, the summer of 2015 in Washington, DC, and it takes place, um, it involves these two childhood friends who reconnect as adults. And they meet at a gay wedding, um, they connect for a bit, and then they go their separate ways. And then so by now it's the fall, and one of the characters um, who narrates the book, his name is Sebastian, um, is a high school teacher of, of art history and English. And so he is, um, uh, licking his wounds from the loss of, of a long-term relationship and is getting ready to, to start his, his year. And so I think that should be everything that you need. So this is, this is in, in his voice. If my students could rebuild their lives every school year, surely I could too. And to start rebuilding, you had to tear everything down. Look closely at the foundation. 
If the foundation wasn't stable, the structure wouldn't be either. Principle of architecture from Phidias to Philip Johnson. It would start, I decided, with my classroom. On a Sunday morning in late August, I took several large plastic tubs of books and papers and posters out to my car and drove to Mortimer Secondary School. I'd be teaching in a trailer this year, possibly next year as well. In response to an influx of new students, renovations had started on the school two days after graduation. First would come expanded hallways, then work to replace the school's early 80s exterior, a carapace of brick and concrete. It would be a facelift for the 21st century. Construction was starting on the western edge of the school and moving east, which meant my classroom for the, for the last three years was one of the first to go. I and several other teachers had been unceremoniously reassigned to trailers parked like placid cows along the school's blacktop. Siberia, we called it. The sky that morning was cloudless, nothing to give it weight save for several distant airplanes unzipping the day with their white contrails. Two miles before the turnoff to Douglas Mortimer Road, traffic stalled. What should have been a simple 10-minute drive became a 40-minute crawl. Idling past the scene of the accident, I saw a horse trailer detached from a nearby truck and upside down in the small ditch that ran parallel to the road. Off in the grass, where the lawn ended in a tangle of underbrush, a giant shape lay blanketed in blue tarp. Two women stood next to it, arms folded, crying and gesturing to a police officer. I found myself, like everyone else, stopping to stare. I thought about dogs. I thought about my mother. Then, urged by two irate honks behind me, I continued on my way to school. My trailer, T5, sat in the shadow of two basketball hoops. Its thin door creaked open onto a room with threadbare gray carpeting. The overhead lights did little to improve the gloom. As I walked around the space, I noticed how tender the ground underneath was, imagined at some point during the school year a student dropping thigh deep through the floor. I put my boxes on the empty teacher's desk, my computer was scheduled to arrive next week, and began to rearrange the scattered tables and stacked chairs so they faced me and, behind me, the whiteboard. I thought of my own school days, the dated clack of rotating slides in my own AP art history class, a gothic church or Botticelli Fantasia sometimes appearing upside down to titters from those students still awake. Now I pulled everything up on a computer screen, a slideshow I could build and edit right from my desk. Still, I couldn't give up the laminated exhibit posters I'd picked up at thrift stores or the paintings I'd printed on stock paper my first year of teaching, inspired by a high school teacher who'd collaged his entire classroom with writing from students who'd long since graduated, some of whom could very well have already been dead. I wondered if the thin defenses of this roughshod kingdom could handle so many prints and posters was surprised the television suspended from the ceiling hadn't already brought about the trailer's collapse. And the books. I always saved the books for last, art books and exhibit catalogs, my own, my father's, collected over the years from secondhand shops, from museum discount piles and library sales. Books on Renoir, Degas, Cassatt, Picasso, Hiroshige, O'Keeffe, Trumbull, Turner, Monet, Special exhibits on Goya and Remington, on illustrated manuscripts, on printmaking, on the Ashcan School. Academic studies of Raphael and Gauguin, of Egyptian deities and Byzantine angels. A paperback of Vasari's The Lives. Poems by Michelangelo, letters by Van Gogh, essays by Ruskin. Multiple editions of textbooks by Jansen and Stockstad, wrapping the straight edge, warping the straight edge of an entire shelf. These I unpacked ceremonially, one by one, to the sound of jackhammers and the beep of reversing construction vehicles from outside. I sat in my desk chair, flipping through the glossy pages, thinking back on childhood days when I used some of these very same art catalogs and monographs to explore, always in secret, always in shame, their nude male bodies in marble, in oil, in charcoal, and pen. Those dumb, silly days when I was naive enough to believe I was the only person in the world who lived with the deep dread of dreaming about other boys' penises, lips, stomachs, buttocks. At sleepovers with friends, the small group I'd managed to cobble together after Oscar disappeared the summer before seventh grade. While other guys crept into computer rooms and waited impatiently in the dark for nude women to appear line by pixelated line, I'd long to be back home, in my bedroom, 
staring into the soft face of the young Joseph Mallard William Turner in his self-portrait from 1799. The enormous eyes, the dark bubble of his lower lip, the handsome Roman nose, the parted forelocks. Imagine an entire gallery crammed like some 19th century European museum with Turner's self-portrait and countless other works curated over the years, below each an ekphrasis with which the marginally curious could piece together the boyhood of a late 20th century suburban homosexual named Sebastian Allen Mote. Oh, thank you. Such great. It's so, it's so wonderful to uh, hear uh, your words in your own voice. Uh, just like listening to you, I feel like I, um, I get like such a, uh, such a much more of a connection to it. Um, uh, and I just really, really appreciate uh, that. That's why I love coming to readings, hearing the authors read. Thanks, Nick. Um, the first question I wanted to ask, um, and something that I've been thinking a lot about um, as someone who teaches queer literature, um, is that this book is very much about a particular moment in history for queer folk in this country. Yeah. Um, it's sort of bookended between two events, beginning with um, the legalization of gay marriage and being at a gay marriage and um, sort of uh, being both uh, sort of happy, excited, uh, but also there is kind of like a malaise for some of the characters uh, for that. And um, I see this uh, sort of looking at this moment through two lenses, Sebastian's and Oscar's. And Sebastian is more, um, not forward looking per se, but more longing for uh, a kind of uh, high school experience or childhood that what his students have. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, he helps form the, the, uh, the queer group there. And then um, Oscar, on the other hand, is sort of very much backwards glancing with this kind of fraught nostalgia for um, the kind of John Ritchie uh, type of queer queer life. Um, and I was thinking, I was just wanting to ask like, how, like, could you talk about that and talk about just like how this sits in these two sort of positions? Yeah, well, I mean, so much of, of, of the novel is, is informed by by the own kind of um generation that i that i myself occupy as, as as a gay man so i was i was born in 1982 i did not come out until 2005 so until my first year in, in graduate school and and i and i've always kind of thought of myself as 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 belonging to to something of a of, of like an in-between generation suspended between these two extremely incredibly different um um, experiences on on the one hand there is the generation before me that 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 lived the AIDS plague right like it wasn't it wasn't history it wasn't something to be discovered or or to learn about in in, in documentaries and and in books it was it was lived experience you know I I did not know anyone um, who died um, of AIDS. I, um, I, mean, I mean, I wasn't even out to myself then, right? So I had no conception that this was even something that I should identify with a part of me. So there's, there's that on one end, and then on the other end is is the younger generation, and and not to, you know, not to um, underlook the 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 pain that continues, but but things are are much more improved for or at least extremely visible, I think, in a way that they were not when I was of that kind of, of that kind of age in, in middle school and high school. You know, I had no GSA to rely on. You know, no one, no one in my class was was taking a same-sex partner to a to a dance or or holding hands in the hallway. So 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 much of this novel is kind of trying to, to capture the experience of what it's like to be kind of unmoored between these two very different, um, very different experiences. And, and, and in terms of, of, of setting it up between the, um, the marriage equality ruling and, and the Pulse nightclub shooting, which, which happened almost exactly a, a, a year later, um, it, it, this, this is kind of the, the queer history that, that, that I have firsthand experience of, of living or rather experiencing. You know, I, 
I was alive and conscious of myself as a gay man when gay marriage was passed, right? And, and when those 49 people died um, in Orlando. So, it, so, and so, you know, that, that, that was more experience for me than, than history, if that, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That does, it does. It's, of course, since you and I are similar ages, like everything you were saying, I was like nodding my head. I did not come out until much later than 2005. I grew up in Mississippi and um, mm -hmm. I didn't come out until uh, after I had left uh, and was in grad school. And so I definitely uh, hear that. And just like what a, I've been thinking a lot about, like what a weird um, transitional moment it was in the early 2000s. Um, uh, for gay people, this like mix of visibility, but also um, also closetedness, and uh, you could sort of feel the culture. Or looking back on it now, you can kind of feel the culture trying to like figure out how to feel about gay people, how to feel about queer folk, and mm -hmm. um, and I think your book does such a good job of like remembering that and and that that kind of like uncertainty. And being like in a transitional moment, and not really knowing, uh, yeah. knowing sort of like what's going to come next. Yeah, no, that you're absolutely right, Nick. I mean, because there there is coming out, of course, which which is in itself a very fraught and, and arduous process. But then, I, I feel like the experience that that maybe doesn't get talked about so much is is what happens after, right? Like you are you are coming out to yourself to the people around you. But at the same time, you're also coming into a community, right? A community that has a, a, a history and, and, and a future. And so you're, if you spend all your time coming out navigating your relationship to yourself, then the idea of, of, of coming into um, a community is really about you kind of seeing where you fit um, among your peers, some of whom may have completely different and radical ideas about what it means to be a member of the community than than, than you do, and and how do you how do you kind of of, of navigate um, the the ways that you know the the things that 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 fit you right, and 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 how do you figure out okay, well, this is where I fit in in the community, um, if one can even be said to have found like one place to fit. I mean, there's I I would argue that maybe that's not the right way to look at it. Um, so I was very much interested in using this novel, not as a coming out story, but, but as a coming into and, and, and really kind of focusing on gay men in the context of other men and not in the context of, of kind of hetero cisgendered um, storytelling. I love that. I love that. And I love also um, Oscar is, I, I love how vitriolic he is in certain moments of the book. And he just yeah. seems like, and I could be wrong, but he just seems like he would be such a fun character to write. Um, could you talk about um, a little bit about your development of him as a character and your development of Sebastian? They're both, uh, both sections, alternating sections in the book told in first person, but the voices are so uh, distinct. Mm -hmm. And even the form in which they each tell their stories are completely different. And I was just wondering how, uh, sort of, how did you navigate that? How did you, um, how were you able to balance that in the, in the writing of the book? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, I, I suppose I just think form is function, right? And so, so I knew that it immediately that if I was going to be oscillating the story between two very different characters, and it was going to be in the first person, because I would argue, is there any other perspective to use about a story that really focuses so heavily on, on identity um, and, and, and the self? Um, you know, I, I knew that they even had to look distinct on the page, like even just the, visually the way that the text is laid out. So for the Sebastian sections, I mean, Sebastian is a character who, you know, very much lives in the past and, and lives in his own head. So for me, it just made sense to have his sections appear as, as basically like bricks of text um, to, to kind of really mime that, that claustrophobic feeling of, of A, someone who's living in their own head, but also someone who, who is perhaps bricking themselves in and, and walling themselves off from, um, from, from, from the future. Um, and then on the complete opposite hand, you have Oscar, um, who's, who's just the way the sentences I envision the sentences on the pages are very kind of spiky and and, and vitriolic and and 
you know, one word paragraphs and, and just things to make him so radically different from someone as, as, as kind of, you know, th this is, this is not the kindest word to use, but for the sake of brevity, someone as uptight as, um, as Sebastian. Um, so yeah, so, so those voices had to sound different. They had to look different. Um, and to me, it just really, I just wanted to add like just as many layers as I could to remind the reader, these are two very different people who live on the extremes of a spectrum. Um, and, and this novel is about, well, what happens when you, when you mash them together? You know, it, 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 um, I've, I've kind of, I've been telling other people, I, I, I kind of in many ways think of this, of this novel, at least when I was drafting it as a cockfight between, <laughs> you know, to, uh, to, um, just, just two, two, two very different, different um, gay men. And so I wanted that difference to work, not only in the tone of their voice, but just the way that it, it physically looked on, on the page. That's wonderful. Yeah, I, um, I love that. And I love that um, portions of, uh, I, I think that was such a smart move to make the Sebastian sections, the, um, the blocks of text, because there is a, I would say, I, I would use the kinder term, not uptightedness, but maybe, maybe a kind of measuredness to him, like he's very measured and thoughtful. And like you said, living in the past, but kind of like also very much longing to sort of, uh, uh, longing for what he missed out on and or yeah. what he feels he has missed out on. And then the, the, how you described it, which I thought was really lovely, Oscar's sort of spikier uh, um, uh, prose. It's sort of Oscar's prose reminded me a lot of, uh, John Retchie's book, City of Night, um, and, uh, and how it's just, um, even though I, I feel like with the Sebastian sections, it's someone who is very concerned with like composure and like the flow of the sentence and being very measured and Sebastian, I mean, excuse me, Oscar, I feel like we're just sort of like thrust right into the moment. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's you know, I've, I've always thought like, Obviously, the chief difference between these two characters is that they have very different ideas about what it means to be gay. But, but for me, a, a kind of higher level difference between them is basically their relationship to the past. Um, you know, Sebastian, all he can all he can think about is the past, um, and someone like Oscar couldn't even be bothered to um, to 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 remember it either his own personal relationship with with his childhood friend or i mean you know this is this is a guy who who goes around in public wearing a shirt that says marriage equals death and doesn't really understand the kind of really loaded historical significance behind what these signs and, and signifiers and, and messages mean it just to him it just looks cool um it just looks gay but he's not really thinking about it i don't i would argue that he's not really thinking about throughout much of the novel, he's really just not thinking about um, about the past. And I mean, so so much of like our own development, right? Like living in the present is really about trying to find some kind of balance and, and negotiating your relationship, both with the past and and with the future, right? And and if you if you give too much weight to one or the other, then then you know that um, that's where you get the kind of troubled characters that that I enjoy writing about, and, and I certainly I certainly enjoy enjoy reading about. Same, I uh, I, I liked what you said about uh, Oscar, and it reminded me of um, uh, of when he is peeking over and looking at. We have to talk about the queer author that you evoke in the <laughs> book, um, and uh, how this seems to be a kind of um, this book in itself is trying to situate itself not only in queer liter queer history, but also like queer literature, a particular type of of sort of quote unquote gay novel that that was yeah. that was written sort of in our in our storied past. Uh, and uh, and I love that moment when Oscar looks over at the um, the author's uh, journal and sees how do you take someone like O oh, seriously? Yeah. And and um, I was just wondering like like. First of all, like what inspired you to include this this like gay author in the in the text, and um, how did you see uh, his relationship to the Oscar character as working in the book? Yeah, so so the character of 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 Sean Stokes. I mean, obviously, I I needed someone who had 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 lived and breathed in almost every fiber of his being. This kind of gamut of experience from from you know the the 
urban 70s all the way through um, through the, the, the AIDS plague um, and, and who had experienced that firsthand in a way that a character like Oscar had not. So someone who is, who is, who has, has, has basically lives and, and breathes history. Um, there was a, there was a small, the reason I chose an author, I, I think probably because literature and, and books were, were my own entree into, um, into, into, into gay culture and, and, and gay life. I mean, I, I would, I would seek out these books in, in libraries as, as a preteen and, and, and a teenager and, and, you know, <laughs> let's be honest, like I wasn't interested in, in the language or, or the story, right? I would, I would specifically try and hunt down these very kind of, for lack of a better term, like ethnographic passages of, of, of sex between men, just to, just because that was, that was my way of, uh, that was my introduction to it. Um, you know, and then, and then my parents got a personal computer and that, and that of course ruined everything. But, but for, for, for a lovely time, like literature and books were my window into like, how gay men acted and, and, and behaved. And so I suppose in, in having Oscar connect with that person or a person of that type um, was kind of perhaps a, maybe just a, a, an homage to, to just a, a part of my own, my own development as a, as a gay man. This is interesting. I know what my answer is and I'm just curious about you and not to put you on the spot, but do you remember what the first gay book you read that was like explicitly gay and you were like, oh my God, this is like me, I see myself. Well, so I- Or a version of myself, or I see like experiences. Yeah, well, I mean, when I say I was closeted though, Nick, I mean, I was like deep under boxes and sweaters. And oh mom, yeah, me too. Right, so, so it was really only like in the months, honestly, before before coming out that I that I thought of of, of, of homosexuality as anything like other than other than sex, right? So I, I never kind of saw it as, as a community to belong to until I was really, you know, kind of close to, to coming out. So I, I suppose like there, there are gay texts that I read kind of beforehand um, and, then, and then afterward, I would say, so beforehand, there's this book by Anne Rice called The Vampire Armand. Oh, I know of The Vampire Armand quite oh, okay. well, yeah. Right. So it's about it's about this teenage boy who who gets inducted into this brothel and and has a relationship with this with this older vampire, and so that was kind of a, a you know a a, a a a tome for me for a while, um, and then I remember in, in the coming out process I bought um, or I didn't buy I, I rented from the library um, My Lies by Edmund White, which is just mm. a, a collection of essays, and and that I remember being the first book that I read, thinking oh like. Edmund White is 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 like me. Like this is this is this is a part of my of my history and and my 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 community. Even though maybe I I don't live the same lifestyle as as Edmund White. Like I'm still you know a, a, a fraternal with him. So yeah, yeah, I feel I feel as if Anne Rice is perhaps the patron saint of closeted gay boys, <laughs> <laughs> or she was for a certain time. They were. They, I mean, they're they're so incredibly um, so incredibly homoerotic. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. To, the, to the point where I wonder how my development would have, would have been shaped had I not come across, um, had I not right. come across books like that. But yeah, well, it seems very. Her books also seem very preoccupied with art too, which your book is. And mm -hmm. and I wanted to talk a little bit about the role of paintings and artists. And because um, I think I was talking to you about this earlier, one of the there's so many joys to reading this, um, but one of the joys that I loved was reading. Sebastian or sometimes Oscar talk about paintings and Sebastian sort of um, segmented them off in like bold print and would like talk about the paintings. And what I loved about that is it, um, it uh, uh, allowed me to like look up the picture if I wasn't familiar with it or even if I was um, to, uh, to look at it and sort of get like this really it's really interesting other connection to the story. And one of the paintings that you keep going back to in the book or that the characters keep going back to, and not until I was looking at the, at the painting after I'd finished the book, did I realize how much the painting like um, plays into the ending. Yeah. <laughs> and I won't give anything away, but like, but, um, but Watson and the shark is, is like a, a huge, a huge deal in this book. And could you yeah. talk a little bit about your relationship with that painting and then just like art in general? 
Yeah, sure, sure. So that painting actually hangs in the National Gallery of Art, and it, it kind of occupies its its. Uh, I wouldn't say it's completely private space, but it's. I mean, it's it's the star of the show in in the particular gallery there it is, where it is. So every time I go there, um, and and like Sebastian, I, I do share a love of of art, and, and there it and there it is, and all its and all its um, homoerotic glory. Um, um, so I, I mean, I would see it all the time, but I, I remember seeing, I used to love sharks. I still do. I used to love sharks, especially as a kid. And so I remember distinctly seeing this painting um, in, a, in, a, in a book about sharks. I, 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 had, it a I had it as a child. And, um, you know, I, I, it, it, this is, of course, only something that I can really glean from, from hindsight, but I wonder what my interest in this painting was. You know, was it really the shark? Was it, you know, the, the, the twink who's about to be... You know, <laughs> Um, there, there's just, there was, there was a strange kind of, of convergence between my, my kind of still very nascent sexuality and, and, and just my kind of just inherently childlike interest in, in, in sharks and, in shark attacks. And so that was, that was really the, the impetus for, for that particular painting. Um, in, in terms of, of art in general, um, it's really just a way that kind of Sebastian processes his his memories. I mean, so every time he these these passages come up, they're triggered by you know him um, walking through an art museum or you know flipping through some of the catalogs that he has to to give to his students. Um, and it's basically just a way for him to process his personal history. And I was thinking about also the the ways that we engage with art too right like we we watch a film or we look at a painting or or read a novel or or listen to a, a piece of music and we're experiencing it there's a conversation between us and and the the artist right but then also there's in, in many cases there's a relation there's a conversation between us and ourselves and so these these sections where sebastian uses artwork to kind of get at the heart of of his own feelings about about his friend Oscar and, and his experiences as 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 a young gay man um were just were my way of of kind of trying to to capture that that conversation on the page. Lovely. Lovely. Yeah. Yeah, that's really, really great. I I love those passages so much. Um I mean would it I can I can read just a quick passage, an example of that if you think that Oh my god, that would be that would be great. Yeah. Would help. Yeah. Um, I think, I think like the, right after you read, I think in chapter two is when you begin to talk about, when the narrator begins to talk about Watson and the shark. Thanks for calling me out, Nick. I <laughs> know I was, I was worried that it was, it was running on too long, but I'm glad we, I'm glad we, we talked about this so I can, um, so I can read it. Yeah. So this will just, this will just give you, um, an example of, of what Nick and I are referring to, um, so this is Watson and the Shark, John Singleton Copley, 1788. I'm on a field trip with my third grade class to the National Gallery of Art. My mother is a chaperone, keeping up the rear behind a group of eight kids who follow the docent through the galleries. We find ourselves in front of an enormous oil painting. That doesn't look like a shark, someone says. That's because it was invented by Mr. Copley, the docent explains. Someone asks, why is that man naked? I think it's a girl, someone else says. Look at her long hair. A new kid, Oscar Burnham asks, did he die? No, the docent says. The young man was rescued. He lived a long, happy life. Later, during lunch on the grass outside the museum, I see the new kid sitting alone. He looks lonely, my mother says. Go over and talk to him. I take my lunch and sit next to the new kid, the two of us at a slight remove from the rest of the group. You just moved near my house, I say. I know, the new kid says. I see you playing outside from my bedroom. Come out next time, I say. The new kid just has carrots with his ham sandwich, so I share my grapefruit roll-ups. We spend the rest of lunch pressing small squares of dried fruit into the roofs of our mouths. We attach small strips to our tongues and pretend we're lizard people. Yeah, so good. So, so good. Should we, um, should we open it up to questions from the uh, audience? Sure. If not, we can just keep. We can keep chatting too. I want to hear more about Anne Rice and your relationship to her. So, uh, 
I think Anne Rice and Michelle Pfeiffer's Catwoman were my two kind of. Oh my God, Catwoman too. Like, where I think, yeah, yeah, I think we we share that as well. Another sort of like queer icon of of uh, yes. millennial closeted boys. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. How many how many leather daddies were invented <laughs> watching Batman Returns? That's a, such a fascinating character study in hair and how um, mm -hmm. her hair, like the bigger her hair gets, the more insane she becomes. And how, and how it fits under that, under that. I never, map. that's the magic of movies. I never <laughs> understood that. I never under, I still like, that's the, my number one burning question for Michelle Pfeiffer after all these years. How did they fit her hair under <laughs> that cat skull cap? Like, I just don't understand. Oh I, I can't believe I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this, but you know, when I used to, I used to get upset as a kid and, and I would, I just envisioned having tantrums like she has. Remember like after she's been killed and she comes home to her apartment and she's like destroying everything. I would want my moods. I would just, I, I would just have fantasies about just ripping up my parents' house and ripping up my room and, and yeah. I think there's an essay there about the post <laughs> being pushed out the window and being brought back to life by cats. I think so. And, uh, and like that moment of queer rage in, uh, in, that, in that movie, like I, I, I remember vividly when she has like that can of black spray paint and she bursts out the lights and it goes from hello there to hell here. Yes. And that's just like, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes, oh yeah. man, what, a, what an icon, what an icon. I'm guessing we can see that I can see the chat. If anybody has questions and wants to jump in, we are we will talk. Uh, we'd love to talk about Zach's book, but also about, uh, about Catwoman. <laughs> yeah, Catwoman, queer icons. Like uh, it's it's okay. I you know I never ask questions at these when I go to them. So me either I'm always like, scared. Yeah. Like, who am I? Who am I to to complain? But um, what was the most fun about writing this book? Like, what was the most fun scene that you wrote? The, the most fun aspects of it were, were the art scenes, absolutely. I mean, and, and they were fun. I just, I enjoyed writing them. I enjoyed kind of getting swept away in them. Um, but I knew that unfortunately they weren't enough to sustain a whole novel. Um, so so I, I, I enjoyed those and, I, and then I enjoyed kind of fitting them into um, the narrative where, where appropriate. Um, yeah, yeah. I, writing is is, is 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 mostly not fun, but when it's fun, um, it um, it's really fun. And those were those were some instances where I I was just like, wow, like this is great. Like I could do this all day. <laughs> so we actually do have a question um, uh, in the Q and A. Was there anything that didn't make it into the book that you wish did? Uh, um. Hmm, that's like I'm wondering, is there more like Oscar outrage scenes that uh, of them storming straight, straight uh, spaces? <laughs> <laughs> Which I think it's a great idea, by the way. I was wondering if you based that on anything like was that no, something? It was, it was based on on this this just perfectly innocuous and, and harmless thing that that I was invited to through some friends where it was called Bad Gay Bar, right? And so we would we would basically just go and, and hang out at these at these spaces that were or not considered quote unquote gay, like like a Mexican restaurant. Um, but there was there was never any kind of of over the top sense of of uh, you know revolution or or certainly any any, any of the the silliness that I think um, that I think Oscar gets up to is really just an excuse to go out and, and eat and drink. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, that, that seems like a million years ago, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. my God. Okay, so we have another question. Um, well, I, I, feel, I feel bad, I should, I should answer that. Oh, that right, oh yeah, yeah, that's right, sorry, good. Um, but anything that didn't make it into the book that I wish did, um, I had a few more vignettes about Oscar and Sebastian's kind of sexual history um, that, that I, you know, as much as I enjoyed writing them and, and reading them, I just felt like in, in the context of the, the narrative, they, they just kind of, like we got the point. Um, so I, yeah, so I left those out. My editor for my debut novel, my first novel, cut out 10,000 words of my book. And I'm so grateful to her that she did. The book is so much tighter. Uh, Can and you use that for anything else, do you think? 
Um, no, I actually think I actually think they were necessary for me to write as a writer, but to understand the character, but not necessary for the reader. So I don't look at it as like a waste, um, but like I, I I I do sort of think it was. Sometimes I think I have to write more than I need, and the act of revision for me is paring away, yeah, and sort of like shaping and finding the sort of structure under all this flabby fat prose that I uh, okay. that I like write. But I but I and I don't know if you if you agree, but I'm of the option that that it's it's always to have. It's always better to have like an excess of stuff and and kind of chip away at it than than it is to you know to have my editor say well we need ten thousand more words and yeah like, oh, what yes yeah. this is all i had i know i know i know yeah no i agree i agree i think i'm very much a maximalist as well like especially in drafting it just feels very much like a purging of the imagination yeah, this next, I completely agree. This next question is really interesting. Um, in the vein of talking about queer icons, I would love to know both of your moments of culture, the moment that you knew culture was for you, a la Las Culturistas. The Las Culturistas, for those of you watching who don't know, it's a really popular podcast. Um, uh, uh, so yeah, Zach, answer that. I, I can go first, or you can go first. Yeah, can you, you can you go first, and then I'll I'll nod and smile and. Okay, also so so I remember, I I think. So I have two moments: one about pop culture, but then more about localized culture, and it maybe speaks to a little bit about Sebastian's moment of like forming the uh, gay and lesbian alliance at the high school. Um, uh, but the first one is when I was. Uh, on the, I, I was sort of out, but not out yet to my parents, but like out in grad school, living it up in the big city of Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> and me and another friend would, um, like when RuPaul's Drag Race would come on, uh, yeah. back in the early seasons, like the when there was Vaseline still on the movie camera lens, right? And and it was still like, felt like a secret, you know, like a, this like delicious secret. like racing home after a reading with went with my friend and us like making popcorn and watching RuPaul's Drag Race and then a show that came on right after it which was based in Canada called One Girl Five Gays and um did you ever watch that? Is that the one where she has to choose which which guys are straight and which are gay? No 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 this is this is like more of a talk show where this this oh. uh this uh cisgendered straight woman sits with five gay men and they just talk about like popular culture. She like asks them questions and they have to like be honest. It's sort of like, it's, it's like a very, uh, very much like a talk show sort okay. of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was like based in Canada. So okay. it was like, it was like getting a, getting a um, bird's eye view of like what Toronto gays were like. Mm -hmm. um, uh, meanwhile, I would come to date and fall in love with a Canadian. So, <laughs> so that you just prepared you for that. I just prepared myself. Um, the other thing that was more locally for me was when I went and gave a reading in Mississippi at Mississippi State University. And it was, and I went to that school, I went to Mississippi State for an MA degree in English and creative writing. And yeah. when I was there, I was not out. It didn't feel, and, and this was just my experience. It did, I mean, Mississippi State is in a town called Starkville, which, uh, <laughs> which <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, it's a lovely town. I love it. I mean, I love going back and visiting, but I, I just did not feel comfortable coming out in that space. And then, um, but right before I came to give a reading, they, um, they had started a new queer group there that had fought the city council to have their first gay pride parade there. Yeah. And so I was reading, I was coming to give a reading the Friday before their big gay pride parade. And like the student organization was there in attendance and they had me like a little gift bag of like, you know, Starkville pride uh, memorabilia. And yeah. um, uh, it was just like such a moment of like homecoming. Like I was in just like all these sort of like queer people in the audience, you know, coming out and excited excited it was like such an event and I felt like for the first time in a long time at home at a place that was my home yeah yeah I 
I, I would say like my my kind of comparable experience would be when I when I first came out in, in 2005, I was in graduate school at the University of Virginia. Um, and I, I, I joined the, the queer student union. And, and to think back on it, I just, it seems like a whole different person in, in the sense that like, I, I can't believe, like I'm just preternaturally shy. So I, so I can't believe A, I came out of the closet and then B, immediately went and joined this random community of, of strangers. But I, but I did, and 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 everyone was just so, so just incredibly welcoming. I made some some friends there, some from I'm, I'm still in touch with, um, and and there was even at the at the end of the year there was a culminating drag show and in in front of you know an, an audience, and and while I wasn't in drag, I. My, my friend wasn't and asked if I would be part of his skit like we were basically men chasing her around around and, and between the, the tables and chairs and and is there video footage I, of this <laughs> I <don't, laughs> um I don't think so but but just in hindsight thinking wow like just the the kind of confidence and and, and energy that it took for me to do that and and I couldn't have done it without that kind of just like community and, and 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 support and and yeah i just I, I wonder how my experience would be different i mean so much of this book is about characters wondering how their lives would be different um i do wonder what it would be different if, if i had not had that that kind of set that community to really kind of meet me basically just like right out of the starting gate um and yeah. and, and kind of kind of reach out to me and, and that um that yeah that meant a lot that chosen family is so important it's it so, so important for those of us in the queer community. Uh, Scott asks a really interesting question about um, wanting to know what your writing process was like. How did you get to know your characters? Yeah, so my Scott, my my writing process um, and, and, and getting to know the characters. I mean, I'm and I don't know how how you are, Nick, but I'm the kind of person where I I even had a post it note um attached to the bottom of my, my computer that said write forward so i i start writing um and, and and i don't stop and i don't look back until i've had you know 300 something pages and and, and had a first draft knowing of course that you know 70 percent of that is is garbage but just having that and printing it out and and and, and having that occupy physical space on my desk um really just it, it makes me feel like I've accomplished something and so when I feel like I've accomplished something it, it gives me the 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 kind of stamina and courage that's required to to really sit and, and and revise and revise and revise which is which is the part of writing that as I've matured as a writer I enjoy so much more than drafting I don't know if if you feel the same way I absolutely 100 percent I hate drafting but I love revision because you know at least I have something to work with. It can be total, total garbage, but it's there. Like I can see it, um, and I can just sit down and 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 retype it and and make changes and 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 edits as as I go along. And so, in terms of getting to know the characters, I think my my relationship with them evolved the more I I basically rewrote and and rewrote their stories. Um, you know, I I. I I, I, you know, I, I have empathy for both of them. I, I, anyone who knows me would obviously say that I'm, I'm much more of a, a Sebastian than an Oscar, but I, I, you know, they, they were both, they were both just really kind of exercises in, in exploring, you know, what my own life might have been like had, had things, you know, turned out differently than, um, than the way they, they did. So yeah, so that, that certainly, my relationship to the characters definitely um, evolved over time. But, but as, as I was writing them, you know, I would write in Sebastian's voice for a while and then I'd get tired of it. And then I'd wanna go on to Sebastian and then, or Oscar, excuse me. And then I'd be like, like, I've had enough of this prick. And then, you know, so <laughs> back and forth that way. And, and, and in a way, I, I, I hope that the reader feels that, that something akin to that experience. Like I, I don't, I don't think that either voice is enough to, to sustain an entire novel in the sense of the story that I wanted to tell. Like the novel very much depends on their voices being braided and not necessarily coming one after the other or, or being divided into, into two books, so to speak. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I thought you did. I thought the way you handled the two voices was just such a master class in how to do that, how 
the overlapping worked so, so nicely. And um, what is so tricky about doing something like that, that I've found teaching, teaching like student writers who are very interested in like showing a varied perspective is that they, each perspective will retread over similar ground and it can come to sound repetitive. And this book just sidesteps it completely. And it's just always, like you said, like you said about the, um, the post-it, it just like moves forward. Like I was always excited to sort of jump into the other character's mind for a bit. You gave us enough time with each of, each of them, I thought. And that was just such a wonderful like achievement and balancing act of this book. Oh, thanks, Nick. I, I appreciate that. That that kind of narrative propulsion, I think, is something that, or propulsion, excuse me, is something that I, I've definitely learned from reading um, Alan Hollinghurst. He's someone who does mm -hmm. this so well, where his his stories move forward in time. I mean, sometimes even over a hundred years and in, in four hundred pages, and, and every time you know you you kind of switch from one kind of time and place to another. Perhaps this annoys some writers, but it's always really. It, made me much more invested and engaged in what I'm reading is there, there's maybe you maybe spend the first two to three pages of a new section almost playing catch up right and and thinking okay well how did we get here and and why are we here and and, and what happened in in the interim um so I, I that the aspects of of my book that that kind of at least attempt to do that are are definitely um the the product of my my just being so infatuated with Alan Hollinghurst novels um yeah Hmm, that's so good. We have another question saying, what are you working on now? Oh, well, well, thanks for asking that question, because that was going to be my question for you. But I felt it was inappropriate for one writer to ask another what they're working on, because it puts undue pressure. But well, now that says, what right. are we both working on? But I just wanted to keep the focus on you. But I'll answer after you go. <laughs> um, I, um, I'm working on um, a couple fiction projects. One is a new novel. Um, and then a, a collection of, of stories. And um, they're both kind of too tender to really get into um, at, at the time, at any like greater depth, at least until they're sold. Um, and so, yeah, but, but they, are, they are both very queer, even though some of them don't necessarily involve gay men. So I, mm. I suspect that I will be writing about kind of larger queer themes for a long time to come, even if I'm not, you know, I, I'm at the point where I'm a bit tired of of, <laughs> of thirty something gay men for the moment. I, I need, I need a, I need a break. You yeah, know, we all need breaks from from men after a while. <laughs> right, that's like the old joke where we may be attracted to men, but we don't necessarily like them. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> exactly. exactly. Um, yes, I am working on a project. I, I won't say too much about it either because I'm still like in the throes of research about. Um, uh, radical fairies. And uh, I am like been loving my research and talking to people who are in the community, but like I've currently just got my hands on this document, witchcraft and the gay counterculture. I've read it a couple times, but now I'm like going through it and like rereading it. Um, it's out of print right now. And I had to like get the book from my library and then I had to like make some copies of it. Uh, so I could like- No, uh, no, no pressure, Nick, but hurry up. Like that, yeah. sounds, that sounds really interesting. Yeah, I'm, it's like all my stuff is going to be set in Mississippi. So, um, okay. Uh, okay. but yeah, and I, I think like this like leads me to uh, one more question about your book. And that is uh, just like thinking about it in place. Just um, what is your relationship to uh, Washington, D.C.? And are you in Washington right now? Are you in D.C. right now? Is that I where you are? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I grew up in, in, in Northern Virginia and I've been living in, in DC itself since 2009 um, and have, have moved through various spots throughout the city. So I spent a good chunk of my time um, in, in Logan Circle, which is, I don't know if it's still considered, but quote unquote, the, the gay neighborhood, um, which is just a couple miles, a couple miles, a couple blocks um, north of the White House. And then for the last, I'm gonna get in trouble, but I think like maybe six years I've been living with my partner in Northeast DC. So over closer by, by Catholic University. Um, yeah, my, I, my relationship with, with DC, I mean, to put it kind of crassly, this is, this is the only city I've been gay in. So I, I really, you know, I, I suppose in that regard, I, I don't know any better. I don't know what it's like to 
be queer in, in, in another city or, or even in, in a small town. I mean, I suspect they're very different in certain ways, but I suspect they're also very similar um, as well. And again, it just really goes back to, to finding a, a, a community of, of, of people you, you feel comfortable with and, and kind of finding these incredible friendships that I think the two characters in, in this book spend so much time you know, trying to search for, even though it's right in front of their face. Um, and, and yeah, that, that just, that makes all the, friendship just makes all the difference in, 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 in the world and, and, and queer friendship and, and intergenerational friendship is something that at this stage in my life really just kind of, you know, interests me. I've, 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 <laughs> I've, 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 I've been out long enough that, that I, the, the, the kind of pursuit of just getting laid has, has, has worn off by now, right? It's, it's about trying to find, um, something just something deeper and more meaningful and and again like just coming into a, a, a community and, and cultivating a relationship with that community's past um and also also with its its future regardless of of, of how different they may be than from from my own lived experience that's so beautiful and also i feel as if what you were saying about queer friendship is so important uh, and queer community is so important like now more than ever in these sort of like mm -hmm. isolated moments and how a lot of us are are sort of you know isolating and still in quarantine and it's just sort of reified for me how precious queer community and queer friendship really is absolutely absolutely yeah yeah it uh, um i think we're close to the eight o'clock did anyone have any last questions or Zach? Okay. This was lovely. Yeah, this was great, Nick. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you both. Interestingly enough, I was talking about queer representation with a friend today, so I did not realize I needed this talk as much as I did, but thank you both for, for being here and having it. Yeah. Thank you for uh, having us. Yeah, this was great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank uh, you, Zach, thank you for letting again. me be a part of your book. I really oh. enjoyed it. It's been one of the one of my favorite books I've read in years, and like I just I just wish you nothing but the best. Thank you, Nick. I, I'm I'm just such an incredible fan of your work. So it really it just means a lot to to hear you say that. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. So thank you guys again for a wonderful night in. Um, thanks to all of you out there too for spending your evening with us. You can learn more and purchase tonight's book. Let's get back to the party through the link in the chat box. And on behalf of Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Mass. Have a good night. Keep reading. And please be well. Good night. Bye.